morning, everybody. My name is Angela Cox, and I'm giving the spotlight talk this morning. I would really like to thank the volunteers for allowing me to join their wonderful program of weekly talks on aspects of the collection at Kenwood. And I'm going to talk about Gainsborough's going to market. Gainsborough's picture going to market was painted sometime in the late 1760s, early 1770s. And what we can see here is a group of rural labourers travelling along a winding path. And you can see that the leading pack horses are laden with vegetables. We can just about make out carrots and cabbages and onions and potatoes. And as they progress towards the viewer, we notice little red-haired boy at the front pointing to a group of women crouched by the side of the track. The picture was commissioned by the second Viscount Bateman when Gainsborough was living in Bath. Bateman was an important client. He had commissioned family portraits, Gainsborough had given him some drawings, and rather later he owned a copy of Gainsborough's Shepherd's uh, with fighting dogs, which also has ended up in the Kenwood collection. In 1888, having descended through the family, the picture was put on sale. It was bought by Agnews and then sold on to Edward Cecil Guinness with the same title, Going to Market. Now, this is not uncontested. In the exhibition of Gainsborough's portraits and landscapes at Tate Britain in 2002-03, it was exhibited as evening landscape with peasants returning from market. There's also some discussion about the occupation of these travellers. And I'll return to both these questions when we explore the painting in detail a bit later. First of all, some biography. Gainsborough was born in Suffolk, in the little market town of Sudbury. He was the fifth son of a cloth merchant, John Gainsborough. And when he was about 13 years old, in 1740, he was apprenticed in London to Hubert Cravelot. He must have been precociously able because within a few years, by about 1734, he had his own workshop in Covent Garden. He had early successes with small landscapes in the Dutch manor. At the age of 19, in 1746, he married Margaret Burr. She was the illegitimate daughter of the third Duke of Beaufort and brought to the marriage an annual allowance of 200 pounds. Now that's about 25,000 pounds in today's money. And this was always a cushion for the Gainsboroughs. Uh, obviously he had to make a living as a painter, but if things got very hard, they would never be left to starve. In 1747, a little girl was born and she was christened Mary after Gainsborough's mother, but sadly died in 1748. However, she appears in this early self-portrait, which I presume Gainsborough made as a calling card, showing how he could achieve very attractive little figures in a landscape, in a landscape setting such as you see. They're elegantly dressed, though rather stiffly posed at this stage. But nonetheless, he's clearly very competent. In 1749, he decides to return to Sudbury and in a sense, start all over again. Um, he continues with his uh, standard portraits in a landscape um, pictures, uh, most famously Mr. and Mrs. Andrews on the top right-hand side, which is now in the National Gallery. And I'm not going to talk in any detail about it, except to point out that this is a rare example of Gainsborough placing his figures in a real landscape, the estate owned by Robert Andrews. He usually portrayed them in some kind of imaginary space, as you can see in the portrait below of the Gravener family dated uh, in the early 1750s. Two more girls are born, Mary in 1750, named after presumably her dead sister, and in 1751, Margaret. Then in 52, he moves to Ipswich, which is the county town, and gave him more professional opportunities. 
He paints the local gentry, uh, such as the Gravener family, uh, but he also paints small landscapes, continuing uh, what he was doing in London. These early landscapes are enormously influenced by the Dutch Golden Age artists, the artists that Gainsborough admired, Risedale, Hobbema, and Winyans, whose painting we can see here on the left-hand side. We notice a relatively crisp brushwork technique and contrast between light and dark areas with little figures dotted through the landscape. Here you'll see the figure on horseback with somebody in attendance and the dogs. And then if you follow this rutted path round a corner, we can just make out another figure in the middle distance. A particular motif of Winyance, he does it a great deal, is uh, to include um, dead trees or blasted trees by lightning um, and then uh, quite a lot of vegetation in the foreground of broken branches and various bits of scrub. Um, and in this next picture which I showed you on the right now you can see in the full screen is one of these early pictures showing a rutted track very much like the Winyance, cow disappearing down the hill, here's a figure uh, resting by the side of the road with his dog. Uh, here's another figure who appears to be by the side of a tree. Um, and a fairly tight and fairly meticulous painting technique. Right from the beginning, Gainsborough sketched in the open air. Here is an early drawing on the left-hand side, quite um, careful, detailed transcription of what he sees before him. Well, we think what he sees before him. And then on the right hand side, a rather curious hybrid. The figure of Gainsborough, we're pretty certain it's a self portrait, has been cut out from a larger sheet and then stuck on to a landscape background. And that is possibly to do with the fact that it was intended as an engraving. Here he is shown drawing with his left hand. We know he was right-handed, but when it was printed, although of course that didn't happen, but had it been printed, he would have been drawing with his right hand. Here is another landscape, a much broader vista now, uh, a panoramic view, rather curiously uh, shaped, probably because it was intended to be placed over a fireplace. And typical of early Gainsborough landscapes, we have little groups of figures. Here's one, then we go further into the picture and there's another little group, some cows, a dog barking at a, at a bird. Uh, and then we follow the, the path round, there's another little figure there. And in the distance, we see a village. Um, a very pleasing uh, uh, landscape, but the figures themselves are not given supreme importance. In a letter, he describes the figures in a landscape as stopping a gap. Now, this is going to change in his later pictures, but in the earlier ones, they do just simply stop a gap, give the eye something to rest on before they then move on to another section of the landscape. When he moves to Ipswich, he's got a slightly more, um, how shall I say, uh, wealthy clientele, slightly up the social scale, and he feels that it's the time for him to work on a larger scale. He certainly can charge more money if you have a whole length picture uh, on a large scale. And he seems to have used this charming double portrait of his two daughters as an opportunity to practice skills that were going to be important for him to develop. He's much better now, you can see, at the anatomy of the figure. The figures are in movement, they're not stilted, as it were, facing the camera. A little girl grasping a butterfly uh, is a charming little motif that he's added to the painting to give it more interest and vitality. And then in 1759, he makes a momentous decision in terms of his life and his career. He decides to move to Bath. Now, Bath is second only to London for having a season of great importance, of great luxury and a huge amount of fun. Initially, people were attracted to Bath because of the medicinal waters. But aside from that, there was the theatre, there were concerts, there were assemblies for dancing, there were tea drinkings, there was a huge amount of social interaction and gossip. There was also 
plenty of time to sit for your portrait. And I'm showing you this caricature where quite clearly the woman has persuaded her rather reluctant husband who seems to have a bird perched on his arm and a certainly <laughs> even less um, happy child who's sort of screaming at the boringness of having to pose for the picture. And there's the ingratiating face of the uh, painter himself. Anyway, he moves to Bath and he brings with him two portraits will, which will demonstrate to potential clients how good he is at capturing likeness, how talented he is in making the figures elegant, making them look socially adept, and to place them in a convincing landscape setting. His wife is certainly pretty enough uh, to be there for the public gaze. And very quickly, immensely quickly, he is successful. Not least because he is known for capturing very good likenesses. But the important thing about moving to the West Country, where there are noble estates to which he is able to see paintings in the original, he finds the two artists that are most to inspire him. For portraits, it's Van Dyck. And within a year or two, he establishes his, I should say, signature style of very elegant figures, beautifully dressed, at ease in the countryside and at ease, of course, with themselves. Um, a painting on the scale of life, quite a complex composition if you look at Mr. and Mrs. Byam. The little girl, Selina, who uh, in fact directly faces us, uh, makes eye contact in a very charming way, was a slightly later addition, presumably when the portrait started. She wasn't old enough to be on her feet and therefore wasn't originally included. And then the clients asked, for her to be put in. And then most wonderfully, um, two years after, three years, sorry, after he moved to Bath, we have uh, the nobility with um, Lady Howe, the Countess Howe, and her husband, the Admiral. And this is a picture, of course, you know very well. So if Van Dyck was the inspiration for portraiture, grand portraiture, elegant portraiture, Peter Paul Rubens was the artist whose work he may have known through the print medium, but it wasn't until he actually saw them in the flesh, so to speak, in noble households, that he realized that he was the artist who would inspire his landscapes. Uh, he wrote to Garrick in 1768, um, he'd already seen uh, Rubin's pictures, but he was uh, telling him um, that he wanted to, to have a look, him to look at this one. I could wish you to call upon any pretense, any day, after next Wednesday at the Duke of Montague's because you'd see his landscapes of Rubens and four Van Dyck's whole length in his Grace's dressing room. And this is the picture that he saw, which is now in the National Gallery. Now, what exactly did he learn from Rubens? Well, what he learned was to open up the landscape to um, make his brushwork much more fluid, perhaps less detailed, less meticulous as the Dutch masters were. He also encouraged him to make the figures more significant, that they had a more meaningful presence within that landscape, rather than simply to plot a route from the foreground to the distance. And so that's what he begins to do. He also uh, goes sketching, as he had done before in Suffolk, but Somerset gives him more variety. Um, and he makes hundreds of these little um, on-the-spot drawings. Um, and there are many references to Gainsborough going out and riding and enjoying the countryside. Somebody, this is Isaiah Humphreys, writes, when the summer advanced and the luxuriance of nature invited and admitted of it, he accompanied Mr. Gainsborough on his afternoon rides to the circumjacent scenery, which was in many parts picturesque and beautiful in a high degree. To these and succeeding excursions, the public are indebted for the greater part of the sketches and more finished drawings from time to time made public. So here in the top left-hand side is a drawing probably made um, en plein air, and then when he gets back to the studio, he adds 
some watercolour washes. And then on the lower right, a finished drawing that he would have sold on and that would have been framed, um, showing um, a, a wagon right coming down a country lane. And he's struck by the way the light hits the lane and hits the foreground figures. Notice now how free and easy the drawing and the wash work is uh, around the trees. Uh, obviously, um, oil paintings as well, cart horses drinking at a stream. And now instead of having little figures all over the place, he's concentrated our intention and focused it on the main motif of a wagon with horses um, stopping to take a drink of water from a pond or a stream. And look at that glorious sunshine, distant view. Um, it's hard to believe that at this time he hadn't seen some paintings by the French painter Claude uh, in the flesh in somebody's collection. I've also included on the left hand side a detail from the vignettes that you saw earlier uh, and you can see the blasted tree and the bits of foliage and broken off branches lying in the corner. And notice also how he's modulated the, um, the greens and the red. So you have browns in the foreground, greens in the middle distance, and as you go further into the landscape, it becomes a sort of misty, bluey, bluey grey. Now, as he was having success with his landscapes, he was asked if he would produce gentlemen's uh, view, views of gentlemen's estates. And because of, I think, his cushion, he was not so desperate, because of the success of his portrait painting career, he was able to refuse commissions. But if his lordship wishes to have anything tolerable of the name of G, the subject altogether, as well as figures, etc., must be of his own brain. Otherwise, Lord Hardwick will only pay for encouraging a man out of his way and had much better buy a picture of some good old masters. So he will not do topography and he doesn't need to. Throughout the 1760s, he paints landscapes and some of them go up for public exhibition. From 1760, a group of artists had formed a society, the Society of Artists, for the express purpose of showing their work to the public. It seems extraordinary now to think that it wasn't until the middle of the 18th century that living artists could show their work outside of the private collection of the owner or possibly um, as they're being completed in an artist's studio. But this was the case. And Gainsborough sent portraits, of course, his finest and grandest ones, and he also sent landscapes. Not this particular one, but I'm showing it to you because of the subject matter, again, peasants on the move, tracking down a road. And here we have a little narrative, I think. They've stopped to allow their cattle to drink and refresh themselves from the stream on the lower right-hand side. And the young man has trotted up so that he is now level beside the very pretty girl on the white horse. And we get the impression that a little tete-a-tete, -a, -tete, a sort of narrative, a flirtation is going on there. Uh, while they pause and before they continue on their way around that bend. And while you're looking at it, I want you to notice too how Gainsborough leads the eye, the harmonious composition. First of all, we have uh, the obvious path, which is a sort of diagonal across here. Um, and it's complemented by that diagonal of the broken tree here coming in the other direction. And then if you look at the way he uses color, we have a white, more or less white cow in the foreground here. Then we get to the middle of the painting and we have a beautiful white horse with a lady dressed also uh, in a lot of white. And then we follow it round and we have another white horse and then we have glimpsed the, the, the whiteness of the track uh, lit up by the gleaming setting sun. So let's uh, go back to our picture and examine it in more detail. As I said, in the late 70s, uh, 60s and early 70s, Gainsborough produced a group of large-scale pastoral landscapes. They were either commissioned directly or sold soon afterwards to wealthy landowners. And these were intended for exhibition, modern pictures, radically modern pictures in their country houses. This one is four foot by five foot, so indeed was the preceding one. 
and they shared a particular motif, that of peasants on the move, which is a constant theme in Gainsborough's uh, 1760s landscapes. But if I refer back to the old one, older one, the previous landscape, um, there is a kind of upbeat mood. There is a nice little flirtation going on in the center. But if you look at this one, I don't think that mood is apparent. It's a rather different feeling that we have here. If it is early morning, the laborers already look very tired. And from what we can discern from the girl's posture and her expression, she is resolutely avoiding eye contact with the women huddled by the track. And I think this is a point to remind you of the social and economic context in which this picture was painted. The Enclosure Acts, which gained momentum in the 1760s onwards, hugely, a huge number of Acts of Parliament that allowed wealthy landowners to buy up common land, waste land, open fields, and incorporate them into private ownership. This had the result of transforming the economy but also changing the lives of many of the peasantry. In some cases, we hear whole villages were depopulated and many villagers had to become wage laborers dependent on what was available from the landlord. Some of them moved to the towns and others, unfortunately, became completely destitute and were beggars. And beggars for charity, beside the roadside was a frequent sight for Gainsborough as he rode through the countryside. And when we get the impression when one looks through this landscape that when we start on the left hand side we see an apparent rural idyll with figures at a cottage door, sheep gazing in a nearby field, and then we move across to the shadows where the poor and the destitute hope for charity. Some art historians have read this painting as a critique, albeit a rather veiled one, of these changes to rural life and a suggestion that Gainsborough has sympathy for what was happening to the rural poor. Now I'd like to move on to discussing methods and processes when it came to painting this picture. Gainsborough's great friend William Jackson was a musician, but he was also a very enthusiastic amateur painter. And he and Gainsborough exchanged letters about painting and indeed about music. And he wrote this to Jackson about composition. One part of a picture ought to be like the first part of a tune, that you can guess what follows, and that makes the second part of the tune, and so I have done. And if you think about it, if we start, and he's using this wonderful metaphor of music, we start possibly with the first movement, the first section of a piece of music, which is here in the distance. And then we travel across the painting until we end up with something rather more somber and melancholy as we reach the end of the composition. He wasn't necessarily talking about this picture, but I think you get the point. Now I want to talk about methods and processes. We know that Gainsborough worked in very subdued light when he started his compositions. Indeed, the same goes for the portraits, gradually increasing the light in order to assess the balance between those lights and dark areas and thus create the mood. He also extraordinarily, and as far as I know, uniquely had another process that he went through and this has been described by a number of people. A table held sacred for the purpose, he would order to be brought to his parlor and thereon compose his designs. He would place cork or coal for his foregrounds and make middle grounds of sand and clay, bushes of mosses and lichens and set up distant woods of broccoli. I think once heard, you will never forget the woods of broccoli. And this is what Gainsborough has done here. And the reason why he did this is because he wanted to be able to control every aspect of the painting. Nothing should, as it were, be up to chance. 
And therefore he used these little models, which he sort of shifted around rather like a stage set designer might work um, for a theat theatrical production until he got everything rightly placed. And then being able to control the amount of light that seeped into his painting room, he then proceeded to do the picture. Now, like all pe painters, Gatesborough was well aware of the work of those artists he admired, specifically the Dutch and Flemish painters, but French ones too. And while he was, um, while he was composing a picture, as he says, from his own brain, his own brain also remembered pictures that he had seen. And art historians have identified um, these two on the top left and the bottom right as possible sources for going to market. Uh, a Boucher, which he may have known from prints, The Encounter on the Road, and a Vuverman uh, print uh, showing um, peasants returning from market. And it's the motif of the woman uh, by the side of the track that he seems to have picked up and used for his own picture. Also, he may have seen paintings by Koip, I'm sure he did, in which large figures or animals in this case are illuminated, backlit by a bright sky. And they're quite monumental figures in the landscape and that's enormously effective, which is what we see in going to market. Now I want to consider, uh, which came up um, about the time of the Gainsborough exhibition, about who these people actually are. And it might give us a clue in thinking about what time of day we're actually looking at. Susan Sloman, who has written extensively on Gainsborough's career in Bath, points out that she thinks that the figures uh, in the middle of the painting, these three here, are in fact colliers. There was a thriving coal mining industry in the vicinity round bath at this period. And as they don't seem to have any uh, vegetables or any sort of produce with them, it's quite possible that they are part of a group of people in which they are the colliers going to market and the leading figures are taking produce. Sorry, they are colliers going to a mining uh, as, as miners and the uh, leading figures are taking produce to market. This may um, uh, substantiate the idea that we're looking at an early morning scene. Here is another version. He seems to have wanted to repeat it, but only once. There is no other similar composition. Now, the colliers, the three figures at the back, and the leading couple assume much greater monumentality. We're now looking very particularly at a group of people. They're not figures in a landscape that just happen to be there. They are the subject of this picture. You can see on the right, uh, sheep um, and grazing on the nearby pasture. And this is very obviously early morning. And the way they are dressed and the way they are grouped and the way they're slightly bent uh, suggests that the previous painting going to market also consists of colliers. He also liked the idea of repeating the motif of the cottage door. And he does this many times in the later 70s and 80s. The earliest version after our picture is the woodcutter's return of about 1772. And they become the chief theme of the landscape. And uh, another one of 1782 on the right hand side. Now I'd like you to think about why clients, patrons should have wished to buy a picture that suggests certain miseries uh, that are existing in the countryside as a result of they themselves purchasing great acres of land and dispossessing the rural peasantry. Well, in order to understand this, you need to remember that there are emerging theories about landscape gardening and landscape painting that make this kind of picture acceptable. And this was the theory of the picturesque. And although they weren't written down until the 70s, 80s and even 90s, they were evolving in the 1760s uh, 
in the circle in which Gainsborough moved in Bath. L literally, the picturesque means a way of seeing nature as though it were a picture. And what you're doing is you are removing, you are editing out unpleasing or even disturbing aspects of rural life by making them appear to be visually, aesthetically attractive. Now, one of the families that he knew very well was the family, the Prices. And Uvidel Price, who was a teenager uh, in the 1760s and knew Gainsborough very well in Bath, was one of the prime writers on the picturesque. And his essay on the picturesque, he describes how old trees with knotted trunks, broken down old cottages, hovels even, donkeys, these are all aspects of the countryside that can be viewed as picturesque. You don't have to think about why the hovels are broken down, um, why the trees are gnarled, but what you do is that you enjoy the pleasure of seeing roughness and variety and differences of color that these objects uh, provide in a painting. And when it comes to people, Uvidel Price says something quite interesting. Objects merely picturesque are to be found in the wandering tribes of gypsies and beggars. So if you can see gypsies and beggars, not as people who are struggling to make a living, who are in some cases destitute, who are outsiders, but merely as attractive elements in a landscape painting, then you can enjoy a picture that actually shows beggars by the roadside. And then secondly, there was another, um, as it were, idea that Gainsborough's paintings evoked. And that was a sentiment gaining currency in the second half of the 18th century, which we know as sensibility. And that means being open to emotions, including compassion for other people, that you can, you're a person of feeling. And having fine feeling also means that you are a person probably of good taste. And so whatever critique Gainsborough might make of the conditions in the countryside, and art historians have made a great deal of this, nonetheless, the people that bought the pictures could feel comfortable enough that uh, the critique was so veiled that they could basically ignore it and just enjoy the paintings. And also enjoy being considered people of enlightened taste who buy the very latest in landscape art. Now, Gainsborough, above all, wanted to be remembered for his landscape pictures. He made a living and he was very proud of his portraits, but the work that he wanted everybody to particularly admire were his landscapes, because they came out of his own imagination. Portraiture is always considered a sort of lesser art form because you're copying something that is there. But the landscape, were imaginative creations of his own brain. And the idea was not that they should be just descriptions of the landscape, but that they should be pictures that would allow the imagination to flow. There is a narrative here. We can think about these people. We can wonder whether they may have some kind of biblical references. There are all sorts of ways in which an enlightened person somebody with literary tastes would be able to take these images. And that is why they became so successful in the late 70s, in the late 60s and into the six, uh, 1770s. Let's leave the last word to Gainsborough himself. He got fed up with the portrait painting, with the drudgery of it, um, with you know, having to deal with clients and their grumbles and their moods and whatever. And he wrote in a letter to Jackson at one point, I am sick of portraits and wish very much to take my vile de gam and walk off to some sweet village where I can paint landscapes and enjoy the fag end of life in quietness and in ease. Thank you very much indeed. Mm -hmm.